So a month and a half ago, I had the privilege of preaching a sermon on Philippians 4, 5 through 7, in this same spot to you same people. And I said that I, I had had the privilege of preaching that to myself thousands, more than a thousand times. And I've, I've heard from you how you have begun to preach that to yourself all the more. And I'm, I'm encouraged by the response of this church and even my heart's response to, to God's word in that passage. We learned that the nearness of our God and sovereign Lord is the only path to true peace. I remember we looked at the command, do not be anxious about anything. And we learned that trust in this near Lord is the only way to truly not be anxious and rather be at peace, reflexing thanksgiving-filled prayer instead of anxiety in the midst of trial. Remember, God promises that for the believer who trusts in the Lord in this way, with thanksgiving-filled prayer and trust, the incomprehensible peace will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. Let's read Philippians 4, 5 through 7 together to remind ourselves of, of what we learned just a month and a half ago together. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So this was a passage, a message and truth that my wife and I had, had gotten to preach to each other time and time again. It was a promised peace that we experienced, have experienced over the five and a half years of our son David's fight with leukemia, my wife's back pain, multiple illnesses, and even years of infertility struggle. It was a passage that's in the reality that's close to my heart because I've seen God true to his word. And I know that trials are not unique to me. I've seen so many in this church be exemplary in the way that you walk through trials modeling trust and being guarded by Jesus Christ in peace. And remember, I hope you remember, I do, that I exhorted all of us and myself first to not wait until we're in a trial, to think deeply on these realities, right? You don't think about God and who he is and how he will sustain you, the things that Smed said we're reminded of. You don't want to think of those things first when the trial comes, right? I said in that sermon that there must be no disconnect between what we do in this room with God's word open on our lap, what you do in the morning when you bring your heart before God's word, and what we do in real life, right? We must not compartmentalize religion and life or doctrine and living. But these truths about who God is and what he promises, the reality that heaven is waiting for us and that everything in this life, our sovereign good God is orchestrating to accomplish his perfect ends. Those realities should and will guard the heart and mind of the believer. So I encourage us not to separate those things. I encourage us to preach these truths to ourselves in anticipation of the trial that was around the corner that we didn't know, and we don't get to choose what it is. I actually want to listen. I have a, I recorded part of the, the sermon. Let's listen to me reminding myself of exactly what I needed to hear, and we'll remind each other of these things. And you know what? That's a joy. Trials are a joy for us because they test our faith. And when our faith is tested, we get to see the author and perfecter of our faith at work in us. Right? When we're asked to do impossible things that God provides the solution to, 
Don't be anxious. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. We get to see God at work. God is glorified. These, this is why we get to count it all joy. And at the same time, listen to this sermon today. Study it on your own in a way that recognizes that a test is coming. You don't get to pick which test comes. But do you know who does? Your loving Father who knows exactly what you need. The one who sent Jesus to die in your place. The one who gave you faith to start with. And the one in whose presence we're going to spend eternity worshiping and just basking in the joy of his presence. That one set the path before you that you get to be on. But you know what? In the midst of that, you still have to not be anxious. You still have to pray with thanksgiving. And God will guard you, your hearts and minds. So listen today with a mind to prepare for what's coming, that you don't even know what it's going to be. So little did I know that when I was preaching that, cancer was actually growing inside of me. I, we don't get to pick our trials, right? We don't get to see around the corner. We don't get to see what's coming even when you leave here. But God does. He doesn't just see it. He orchestrates it. He is sovereign over it and sovereign to accomplish his perfect will. So since then, I've gotten to re-preach that same message and more countless times to myself. So I'm going to expand the glimpse into my heart preaching this morning and let you see more of what I've been sharing with my heart these last years and especially these last couple of weeks. So two weeks ago, I was hospitalized with extreme pain, and intractable nausea, vomiting, and I assumed it was something I ate or kidney stone or maybe pancreatitis, but a CT revealed that my abdomen is filled with very large nodules that they said was suspicious for lymphoma or metastatic disease, cancer. So there I was throwing up in the worst pain of my life, and I get the news at 2 a.m., then my CT scan looks like cancer. What on earth will sustain you in joy and peace in those moments? A follow-up PET scan showed that all these masses lit up as hypermetabolic areas that all the oncologists and radiologists I've seen say is almost certainly advanced lymphoma. You can see there all the black areas are cancer, and it's I'm in, in quite a bit of pain, feeling my weakness right now. So if you would please pray for me as I go. Um, I, I feel like my brain is not all here. That's a good place to be. Weak. Since then, through many nights that have been near sleepless due to pain, and in days where I'm just not myself, fatigued and in pain, God has proven faithful to his word. The word that I proclaim, the word that is in his perfect word, the Bible. I say this not to make much of myself, but to make much of my Lord who has prepared us for this new trial and has provided the peace and joy to sustain us thus far. So when people have asked, how are you doing? My reply honestly has been peaceful, content, joyful. So please hear me. This is not about me. Those statements and those realities that somebody, that I can have peace that I don't even comprehend. I, like I said, I, I feel weird saying that. Like, I, I should, shouldn't I be anxious? And then, no. My God ordained this for me. This is not about me. It's clearly outside of me in a contentment that is rooted in eternity and not my circumstances. This has everything to do with the God who saved me and whose spirit is in me and is in you, believer, if you have been saved by grace through faith. 
So I, I pray that my testimony and these words wouldn't be like, oh, great, look at Jake, isn't he doing well in trial? But that it would sustain you, that it would encourage you to go to God's word tonight in a way that will sustain you if you wake up at 2 in the morning with cancer on your CT scan or go to work in the morning and get a pink slip. Fill in the blank. Whatever trial is coming, I, I, I could make up trials for the rest of the night and I wouldn't exhaust what God and his gracious goodness has in store for this church. So I'm here sharing that what I've been caring for my own heart with from God's word for two purposes, to make much of God and to help each person at Grace Bible Church to respond in faith, enjoy peace and contentment to whatever trial you find yourself in today or the trial that you don't have any clue about that's coming tomorrow. It's been ordained in love by your heavenly father. I've read in counseling books, not good ones, and I've heard in some sermons that we should not bring up verses like don't be anxious about anything or cast your anxieties on him or count it all joy when you face trials or all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. I've heard that those are, in the, when somebody's suffering, that is not the time to bring those up. They come across as flippant, as making light of trial. And there is a way to use those verses that makes light of trial. Don't do that. But I'll tell you what, in the midst of suffering, death, heck, even in the midst of joy, these verses reveal something about God that must be the bedrock foundation of your response that will transcend any circumstance you find yourself in. And do you know who the best person to preach that to yourself in those moments is? It's you. Right? Be ready at the drop of a hat to preach a sermon on these passages and more. When you study God's word in the morning, don't say, oh, good, I checked my box. I feel good. Wasn't that great? But say, I learned something about God today that will sustain me when fill-in-the-blank comes. And then when we care for each other, don't be scared to share God with each other. Don't be scared to sit and slowly, gently, patiently preach the reality that God is sovereign and he is good and this life is short to each other. Don't wait until the difficulty to meditate deeply on God and his sovereign goodness and eternal perspective and blessings and trials. And that's why each day in trial and in blessing and even the seemingly neutral monotony of life, you must not deviate from your heart shepherding practice of bringing your heart before the word of God to get the God of the word. Don't merely read but meditate and worship. Don't get, don't get up from your time in God's word until you're more aware of him than you are of your circumstances and what's on, what's on your to-do list for the day. Until your affections for him have been freshly stirred. And any time when you see your heart being gripped by worry, fear, anxiety during the day, that's a sign that your eyes are off the Lord. Get your heart back in front of him in God's word in prayer, in meditation, with each other. And out of the overflow of this, care for your home, care for your small group, care for this church. And as a church, we've all suffered much together and grown together. And if one member suffers, all suffer together. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if God sees fit to grow our church in holiness and faith, even through more cancer, I'm happy to be that guy. One of my best friends said something like that. Let's pray. God, thank you for just a chance to, to share your word with this church that I love. 
God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have not left us to ourselves. Thank you that there's so much more to this life than randomness and chance, that we're not living this life to grasp our best life now, and that wasted days, wasted years, seemingly wasted, where we don't get to do what we want to do. In light of eternity, God, they're exactly what you ordained for us. God, I, I thank you for a peace, for a joy that this world cannot know. And I pray that if somebody is sitting here listening to my words and they say that kind of faith, that kind of joy is foreign to me, God, I pray that through my words, through your word, you would bring them to faith, that you would see fit to change their eternal destiny. Because God, apart from your grace, sufferings, will not prepare us for an eternal weight of glory. God's sufferings are just a precursor to your wrath, to your just wrath. So God, but you died on the cross to take that away from us. So God, I pray today would be this day of salvation for some and that for those who know you, it would be an afternoon, an evening of, of encouragement that would strengthen their faith and mine. In Jesus' name. Amen. So if God were to come to you and say, would you rather, would you rather your son get leukemia and relapse multiple times or that he would be a really healthy and normal kid? Which would you pick? If God came to you and said, would you rather have advanced lymphoma be in worse pain than you've ever experienced and face a very uncertain future? Or would you rather grow old and have incredibly stable finances, a nice retirement, and die comfortably in your sleep? Which would you pick? Would you rather have your husband die at age 36 of lung cancer or successfully translate the Bible and preach the gospel in the mountains of Papua New Guinea? Would you rather lose your job or keep it have a rebellious, wayward, wayward child or a child who's perfect in every way, seemingly? Would you rather have chronic back pain that keeps you from sleeping or be able to get a good 10 hours every night? Would you rather not be able to have children or be fertile and have kids whenever you want? <laughs> Would you rather be single or have the perfect spouse or even much smaller things. Would you rather be stuck in traffic or get to work just on time? What would you say if God gave you those choices? I, I don't think any of us would say, oh God, pick me, give me cancer. Oh God, I want to be in pain. And I don't think we should say that. But... What we should say, if we were given a choice, if God came to you and said, would you rather? I hope that my response and yours would be something more along the lines of, God, I'm not you. I'm not you. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the perspective to pick what is best. But I know you do. Please choose for me whatever is best. So when you and I respond with grumbling or lack of joy in the midst of trial, we're expressing a desire to do it our way instead of God's... Thank you, Omri. That's much better. Thank you. We're expressing a desire to do it our way instead of God's. And the Bible says that in grumbling, we're actually judging God. Just like with anxiety. Remember how we learned that anxiety is denying either God's goodness or sovereignty? Grumbling, lack of joy, is the exact same 
thing, the exact same charge against God. James says that when you grumble, you become a judge. And worst of all, you become a judge against God. Because who are you ultimately grumbling against? God and what he has brought your way. You're in essence saying, if God were really good, he wouldn't have me in this. If God were really all-powerful, he would get me out of this. But in truth, God is sovereign and he is good. So I'm going to rehash some of what, I, of what we learned seven weeks ago and what I preached to my own heart to remind me of God's sovereign goodness to sustain me in the midst of trials. It's really fast. But these are verses that you should know. These are verses that, by the way, if you want to memorize the book of the month are actually CDs. Every single one of these, except for maybe the last one, is on there in song form. You can listen in the car. You can listen in the morning when you work out. But listen to these songs. They're going to you, you can learn song lyrics without even trying, right? And they, they get stuck in your head. How great would it be if the song lyrics were God's words, and particularly ones like these? P- pick those up. Don't just memorize them, but think on them to prepare yourself to know who God is when he brings you a trial so that you are guarded from grumbling, you're guarded from anxiety, and guarded to joy and peace. Hebrews 2.10, by Jesus, all things exist. 1 Corinthians 8.6 says, Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things are all things and through whom we exist. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, for by him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all were created through him, And for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We are dependent on this God for all things. So, like Smed said, right, when you get a good thing, when you eat a good meal, when you experience good friendship, when you experience anything good, you say, This is from that good God, but also. If he were to stop sustaining us, we would die. Things that we just take for granted. If if he were to stop, stop sustaining us, we would die. Every power that we possess is inferior and derivative to him, to his. It is right for us to remember that. Job 34, 14 through 15. If he should determine to do so, if he, God, should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together. And man would return to dust. Sometimes trials are a good reminder of that. Where we don't even realize just how confident we are in our own strength. I know you know this, but think about it. Nothing can happen apart from the Lord. Right? God has supreme authority over all heaven and earth. He has supreme authority over every ruler. There are no accidents in this world, right? Remember, we talked about that. From the inner workings of the smallest subatomic particle to the largest galaxy cluster interactions and everything in between, it's functioning exactly according to God's plan. And he can change it at any moment. How God made the sun go backwards, I don't know. How could he get the light from the stars to the earth in a day? He can do it. How could he keep Jonah alive in a fish? How could he raise his son from the dead? Every single thing that just looks like it's happening, because that's the way things always happen, all the way to the things that can't be explained apart from his miraculous intervention, every single one of those is sustained and directed by him. There are no rogue molecules, no rogue cells, No rogue incidents in the universe. Every single thing, each new day, every season, each year, every breath, every beat of your heart, every chemical reaction in your body is all from him, each working exactly according to his foreknowledge and will. He is the perfect judge who sees all, knows all, 
and will judge all with perfect equity. No man, woman, child, no cancer cell or anything else can lift a finger against you without his permission. And so this is not a powerful, capricious, random God, right, who stands over us looking for somebody to zap with a lightning bolt because wouldn't that be fun? It's the way some people think of an all-powerful God. God, if you were truly that powerful, you can't be good, right? Because look at the suffering around. But let me give you an example of how God used his superintending, perfect, sovereign power. That highly exalted Lord humbled himself, right? The creator became creature. He was born into the world in Jesus Christ. And the all-powerful master of all, he used all of his power to work all of history to accomplish his virgin birth and death on the cross to give his life as a ransom for many. Right, we don't have to, we can't possibly understand how God is working every single thing together for good. We don't have to. You when but just when when you're sitting there saying, God, how is this good? You're asking the wrong question. Say, God, I know you are good, and I know you are powerful, and set your eyes on the cross. Just like that last song. He said, Paul, God said through Paul in Philippians 2, 6 through 11, think about it. This God is the sovereign one who orchestrates all things according to his will. Jesus Christ, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being made in the likeness of men, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is sovereign over all, sovereign over sin, and he uses that sovereignty to accomplish his will. And if you are his child, he uses that sovereignty to accomplish your eternal good. Those are facts. We don't have to sit here and figure out how that could possibly be. We're not called to do that. We're called to trust. We can never say, I sinned because of the Lord, and yet he will cause all things, even the most horrible and difficult things, to work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. You can't meditate on this enough. Even the most wicked expression of sin, right? Crucifying the innocent son of God was predestined and superintended for our good by this all-powerful and all-good Lord. It's exactly what sustained the disciples, the apostles, in Acts 4 in the midst of persecution. You remember they were told to go away, stop preaching in this name, or else many of them would soon die for doing this. And what did they pray? They didn't say, God, take away this suffering, take away this trial, just let us preach without persecution. What did they pray? They prayed for truly, they reminded their heart of exactly what we're saying, For truly in this city, Acts 4.27, in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Right? All of these people who were not God followers were set, were unified together to do something. What was it? To do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Namely, nailing the Son of God to the cross. So there can be no doubt that this Lord is powerful and there is no doubt that he is good. And if you are a believer, there is no doubt that he is good to you. 
So in trials, like I said, we don't need to understand the how. But the depths of these two truths, the Lord's power and goodness, we will never get to the end of. So spend your time before the trial and in the trial and after the trial. Before the blessing, in the blessing and after the blessing. Setting your heart and mind on those things, on the, on the Lord, and those things will be seen most clearly at the cross. Like I prayed, if, you, if this is foreign to you, please don't leave without talking to me. There is no comfort for you in the cross if you haven't put your trust in Jesus. There is none. God is good, and he is sovereign. But not all will experience this eternal blessing. God is also righteous. That's why the cross happened, because he took the wrath that I deserve. I deserve hell. He took the wrath that I deserve, and he placed it on his son, and he poured out just wrath on Jesus for what I did. And I get treated as if I have the perfect righteousness of Christ. And that goes for everybody who's believed. But if you haven't believed, that transfer hasn't happened. When God, the perfect, good, sovereign, and righteous judge looks at you, you will spend eternity not exhausting his just wrath for your sin. But turn to him. That's why Jesus died. Please don't leave without talking to me about that. Or some, any of the elders or really almost anybody here would love to tell you about, about the cross, about the gospel, the good news. It's so like we said, every blessing, every good gift is from the Father. Preach, your heart, preach to your heart with James 1.17. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Romans 8, 31 through 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also graciously give us all things? And namely, all things for which Jesus died. And you can rest assured that anything given to you, believer, is not apart from God's good purposes for you because Jesus died for you. Likewise, God will not withhold any good from us. But remember, we don't actually have the perspective that we need to know what is actually good and what is best. Psalm 84, 11, The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Or Matthew 7, 9 through 11, Or which one of you, if his son asks for a bread, We'll give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? All right, sometimes we don't know what is best, and just like we might withhold candy or something our kids ask from us, we're doing that in love, and, and compared to our wisdom, compared to our children, God's wisdom far surpasses that. He will give you what is best. So these blessings, these comforts, big and small, are simply a foretaste of what God is preparing for us. Think of Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. In 10,000 years, or in 100,000 years, when there's no more death, mourning, crying, and we can see more clearly the web of gracious and good purposes that our God is weaving in his sovereignty, we will not mourn 
the trials that God brought us through. And we will not prize too highly the blessings that we received in this life. Rather, we will know that they were brought, that they will be brought into perspective when we see that they are preparing us for that eternal reality. The, pro- the pain is worth the prize. And it can only last a lifetime. There is nothing in comparison to this promise of eternity with God. And God often prepares us for that day with more than blessing. Right? How does God prepare his bride, his church for that coming? It's rarely through comfort, physical blessing, and ease that we're made holy. He can use those things. But it's rarely through comfort, physical blessing, and ease that we're made holy. Rather, faith is most clearly seen not in times of plenty, right? Faith is most clearly seen when your faith is tested. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 7, In this you rejoice, verse 6, though now for a little while, it's the second paragraph up there, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter's saying, you're rejoicing even though you're grieved by trials. It's just for a little while. Why are you rejoicing? Because your faith is tested and proved genuine. Faith is often defined as believing in Jesus, right? It's, you pass a doctrinal test. Yep, Jesus is God. I go to church. I do some religious things. It's, but, but the tested genuineness of faith does not resemble a test like you might take in a theology class in seminary. Paper and pen, fill in the blank, short answer. Certainly doesn't look anything like hold up a balance of how many good things or bad things did you do or religious things or irreligious things. The tested genuineness of your faith is proven in life as you forsake sin, grow in godliness, love your neighbor and have joy and peace in the hardest of trials because you trust your good and sovereign God who loved you and gave himself for you. Right? Peter says that these trials, though they might last the believer's whole life, are just for a little while. And this sounds a lot like Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. In trials, the believer does not lose heart. Why? Because this short-term mortal, mortal earthly stuff isn't ultimate. Even if we lose everything, if our body falls apart and we die, it is merely preparing for us, preparing us for an eternal weight of glory that, that has no comparison to even the worst struggles. You are a new cre- creation, made new from the inside, and the inner self is being sanctified, made holy made new day by day. And God uses these slight and momentary afflictions to accomplish that, to produce this weight of glory. This affliction that you and I find ourselves in, it doesn't merely precede the glory. It actually prepares us for it, produces us, produces it in us. There is not one second of pain wasted. Every bit of it will be used by God for his good, for our good and his glory. So when that pain comes, when that trial comes, and you don't know when, or if you're in it now, endure and don't lose heart. 
Because we know that if this tent that's our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands. He has prepared us for this very, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. In what condition do you tend to groan more and long for heaven more? When your body's functioning perfectly or when you're hurting? When things are going just as you want or in a trial, when you have a full bank account or no idea where your next meal will come from and you have to trust God like the birds do? Remember Peter Rejoice because the tested genuineness of your faith and trials may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying, sorry. Even as I'm saying this, I'm pleading with God to take this pain away. Right? You can be joyful and content in trials and, and say, God, please, please help me. It's, it's sort of like Paul, right, in 2 Corinthians 12. Th- three times he pleaded with the Lord to take away the thorn in his flesh. There's something particularly challenging for him. He goes, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. God means our trials to get us to the end of ourselves, to magnify our weaknesses so that his strength can be, and his grace can be known. That's why Paul could boast in his weaknesses. That's why he could be content. That's why when somebody asks you, how are you doing? Let's say, I'm content. I'm joyful better than I deserve. Go there before before your mind goes to all that you would want to change about your circumstance. God provides exactly what he asks. And as he is taking his children through difficulties and we find comfort that is only explainable by Jesus, remember that God is treating us He's acting towards us in love and treating us like his children. He's sanctifying us, perfecting us, whittling away sin and crafting us into his likeness. Hebrews 12, 6 through 7, the Lord disciplines the one whom he loves and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? In verse 10, for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to us, but he, our heavenly father, disciplines us for our good. Why? So that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Don't confuse the word discipline with punishment here. Right? Your wrath has been set aside. This is a training. God is setting a path before us in love designed to separate us from our sin and train us towards righteousness, ultimately resulting in the perfection, glorification when we are raised and glorified with him in eternity. And in that day, we will thank our loving father for these trials. Like an athlete might, might thank a coach for making him run the extra wind sprints. If we will thank him for the trials then, and we'll be joyful about the trials and the pain then, we should be joyful, content, and thank him for the trials now. 
So while you're still on earth, God has good works prepared for you, right? If he was done, if he had no good works for you, you'd be in heaven, right, believer? He has good works prepared for you to walk in, and he is training you for those and preparing you for those and for eternity through this discipline, through trials. And it hurts. It's not fun, but it's from the Lord. So it is only with this holiness pursuing, heaven gazing, God glorifying, God, sorry, God's, God's glory desiring perspective, rooted in complete trust in God, that you and I can look at a tri- trial and be joyful in it. James 1, 2 through 4, and this is our last verse we're looking at. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So trials, all of them, are not random things. They're not random things that happen to us, but they are wisely ordained for us by God to accomplish an effect. What is that effect? Our sanctification toward ultimate holiness to which all true believers are destined, right? That we may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Trials are above all else, a testing of your faith, and don't miss that, right? As believers, you should say, God, if if this faith is from you, test it. I want to see you at work in me. So when you ask God to make you more holy, when you ask God to get rid of your sinfulness, you are asking for a trial. When you ask God to help you pray better, to love him more, be a better parent, spouse, or child, you're asking for a trial. You're saying, God, make me a better witness for you, a better evangelist. You're asking for a trial. God, make me elder qualified. Make me a better servant in the church. He's not going to do that with magic wand. He's going to do that through trials through testing of your faith the holy spirit at work so don't grumble when he brings them don't be anxious but trust be content and be joyful remember we don't have the eternal perspective that god has we don't have god's perspective but if god were to give you a choice do you want trial or do you want comfort I hope that you and I would answer, God, I don't have the wisdom or perspective to pick. You're God, I'm not. You choose. And when God chooses trial, may that heart attitude that you shepherd your heart to now, tonight, and in the morning, and you never, never stop. May that guard your heart to joy in trial and peace and suffering. That you would cling to our Savior and Lord who says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect through weakness. Thank you, God, for helping me through this. Let's sing together.